quadrant two, upper left quadrant, because it's above the transverse line. The middle, what I kind of call crosshairs, middle of the plus sign, that's the belly button. Think of that as your belly button. So above it and to the left is your upper left, quadrant two. Quadrant three will be the patients or my lower right. Quadrant four, my lower left. And I have this blue arc right here. The blue arc is what separates the abdominal cavity, my stomach, what we usually call it, my abdomen, from my thoracic cavity up here where my heart and lungs are at. And what that is, is the diaphragm. It is a muscle of inspiration. When the diaphragm pulls down, air goes in. When the diaphragm relaxes, air goes out when you're at rest. If I'm exercising real hard, I may recruit some other muscles to help air, more air come in and out to lift the rib cage and do some other things. But at rest, the diaphragm is a muscle of inspiration. When it pulls down, the lungs inflate. When it relaxes and goes back up to its natural position, the lungs will get smaller, force the air out of the body. While that's going on, air is also going in and from the lungs into the bloodstream. And carbon dioxide is coming back out of the bloodstream. What I want to do with this is look at a few organs and consider these organs, yes, there's many other things in the quadrants. We have our small intestines, large intestines, gallbladder, several other things. So these are some of the few of the biggest. You hear a lot about the gallbladder. So you may want to pay attention to it, but I'm going to stick on certain ones to start off with. The first one I want to talk about is the spleen. The spleen is in my upper left. It's in my upper left quadrant. It's kind of, if you find your rib cage, it's kind of up under those bottom ribs right there. That's how high that spleen is. And the spleen is a very vascular organ. Being a very vascular organ, if it gets lacerated or punctured or it ruptures, then it can bleed out quite vigorously and a person is in a medical emergency. So it would be considered a medical emergency if they have a ruptured spleen. The interesting thing about the spleen is many other organs and things in the body, we get what we call referred pain. Referred pain is pain somewhere other than the injured site. Probably the most common pe one people think about is a heart attack. You get pressure to the heart, but then you get referred pain to the left shoulder, the jaw, the back. You get pain somewhere other than the site of injury. So with the spleen, we get, in, we get referred pain to the left shoulder. That referred pain to the left shoulder is called a curve side. Usually it shows up about 20, 30 minutes after the injury, sometimes quicker, but it's referred pain to the left shoulder. If you're palpating someone that has injured their spleen, you may push and cause referred pain to the left shoulder. It's that ache pain feeling in the shoulder. So occurs curse sign. So spleen, definitely want to pay attention to it. One of those illnesses that can affect the spleen is mono. Someone gets that quote unquote kissing disease. Mono, and usually in the winter, especially for school age kids, college kids, close quarters, especially athletes they're sharing drinks all the time, water bottles, and then they end up getting mono. Mono causes splenomegaly. Splen is the spleen, S-P-L-E-N. Megaly is enlargement. If a large spleen, then we could get it injured if we get hit. So when you think about athletics, that takes on a whole other connotation. Next thing we'll look at is the appendix. Appendix is in my lower right quadrant my lower right quadrant. And one thing to think about is with the appendix uh, is to be able to find it. One way to be able to find where your appendix is at, if you find your belly button and then find the hip bone on the front of your body right there, so kind of the bone that sticks out right on the front, on the front, we call that the ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine. It's abbreviated ASIS. So if you think of a, an imaginary line from your belly button to your ASIS. You go two thirds of the way down that line from your belly button, from the navel toward the ASIS and come about thumb width above. So two thirds of the way from the umbilicus to the ASIS, but a thumb width above or two fingers, two fingers width above, you're over top of where your appendix is at, about right there. We call that location
McBurney's Point, kind of like McDonald's, McBurney's Point, I burn, you burn something. McBurney's Point. Two thirds of the way from the belly button, this is your belly button, and that front bone is here. I'm two thirds of the way down, and a little ways above, and you're over top of your spleen. Or your appendix, I'm sorry. I looked up and saw a spleen, that's what came out of my mouth. So you said you're over top of your appendix. Another one we'll talk about, we think of appendicitis and spleen injuries. Appendicitis, uh, that's where appendix is inflamed. A lot of times it can be a bacterial infection. If that ruptures, that's, that's very dangerous. We don't want that to happen. We want this person in the emergency room. Typically, their temperature is elevated because it's a bacterial infection. About 101, 101.5, somewhere in there. Pretty standard, pretty close to that temperature. Uh, they're also feeling nauseous, pain over McBurney's point, that lower right quadrant pain. They may get radiated or referred pain around the flank, so around to their back. Uh, they also get pain there. Uh, if they pull their right leg back, so you take their right leg and pull it back, so if they're lying, especially if they're lying prone, and you lift their right leg off the ground, it'll pull those muscles tight over top of it, and that causes pain. So a lot of things, okay, wait a second, if they're lower right quadrant pain, and it's over McBurney's point, and they have a temperature, but they haven't been feeling good, then this person needs to go to the emergency room immediately and be checked. Because uh, you don't want a ruptured appendix, because then all that bacterial infection gets out into the gut, and that ball has to be cleaned out, because that could be deadly to someone. Next one we'll look at is the liver. Liver is in my upper right quadrant. And again, it's rather vascular structure. If it gets lacerated, uh, then I have a major problem. Uh, with the injury to the liver, you have upper right quadrant pain. Uh, you could get referred pain to the right shoulder with the liver. Uh, the other thing to think about is if one of these are bleeding out, and we'll talk about here in a second, is uh, what we call hypovolemic shock. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Someone's bleeding out. What? What? How's it going to show up? How are we going to know this if they're bleeding internally and not externally? So we've covered the spleen, the appendix, and the liver. Next, we'll look at the bladder. It's kind of lower middle. We think of quadrants three and four. So lower right and left. But the thing I want to mention about the bladder is that yes, it can be injured. Uh, someone can get blood in their urine. We call that hematuria, H-E-M-A. Hematuria, T-U-R-I-A, hematuria. Blood in the urine. The only way blood can get in the urine is kidneys. The, your, the uh, ureter is going from the kidneys down to the bladder and the urethra from the bladder out. So it's got to be from somewhere, a lot of times it's from a kidney infection or a bladder infection. Speaking of the kidneys, they're upper right and left. And typically they're from back here in the back is where you kind of locate them. You think of the kidney shots, somebody punches somebody here in the back in the lower quadrant. So here's the, here's the dividing line, it's just below that dividing line, or just above that dividing line, I'm sorry. Upper right and left quadrants. With kidney infections, again, you can get blood in the urine as well as a bladder infection. You can tap over the back up here and tap and does that cause pain. It's like a percussion pain. We call it a kidney tap test. So when we think about, we have other structures here, but here's some biggies to think, okay, these are things we really want to pay attention to that could be life-threatening uh, if something happens to, especially with appendix rupture, liver, or spleen, we could be in a life-threatening situation. Typically, uh, we call a medical emergency something that is life or limb threatening. Life or limb threatening. Uh, lacerated liver or spleen, yes, life or limb threatening. Ruptured appendix, yes, life threatening. Then we think limb threatening injuries also is a medical emergency. To the person that's injured, injured, everything tends to be an emergency. Uh, but when we think from the first aid perspective and the medical perspective, you know, some things, yes, they're going to be painful, it's going to hurt, it's not what somebody wants, but it's not life threatening. Some things are. So as you read through things and think, okay, here's normal, here's where these things are located. And then as you read as trauma in different places and how what the signs and symptoms are in your assignments, 
uh, you'll come back to this information and you'll use it. So this is kind of that getting ready for uh, the injuries and illnesses part. Hypovolemic shock. That's one we mentioned a few minutes ago. With hypovolemic shock, hypo means low, volemic volume, low volume. Different things can cause low volume dehydration. Too much blood in the legs is not coming back to the heart, so you've got low volume coming out of the heart. You could go into shock. Uh, or that you're bleeding externally or internally and losing blood volume. So let's look at it from the standpoint of this hypovolemic shock. Signs and symptoms is if, let's say the liver or spleen has been lacerated and somebody's going into hypovolemic shock. Here's the things we'll notice. Number one, we think of vitals. If you, have been if you get trained somewhere or can take a blood pressure, you lose pressure, pressure starts to drop. Number two, your brain picks up that pressure because remember we have baroreceptors up here in the neck on each side, each carotid artery. Pressure is dropping, the brain says, hey, I need to increase pressure. The vessels will constrict, so you start getting that bluish tint a little bit, but then also, because it also shunt the blood to the, in, to the internal. You're, you can shunt blood to where, you, where the body wants to keep it. So if you're trying to conserve energy, you conserve energy, or by conserve heat, which is energy, then uh, you can and shunt it internally, and that's why you kind of get blue fingertips and blue lips in the winter. Because your body's saying, hey, it's cold, I want to conserve heat, let's keep the blood internal. And then when you sweat a lot, you're getting hot, it wants to send the blood to the surface, so it can cool off. So we can blood shunt. So we may start looking pale uh, or bluish. The other thing is the, the abdomen will come rigid. So if you're sitting right now, just relax. Push in on your abdomen. See how nice and pliable it is. It's, you can push on it. When you push on it, when you get when, when somebody's bleeding out, it gets real rigid. The muscles spasm. When the muscle spasm it becomes, almost think of, think of the washboard abs type thing. It may not be that visible, but when you push on it, it feels hard, like someone's guarding against you to keep you from pushing in on, the, on your abdomen. The other thing is if you push it on the abdomen and they allow you to, say if it's, if it's my spleen up here, you could push it on down here on the lower portion even and push it and let go real fast. So if you're sitting there, relax. Take your hand, push it on your abdomen, sit and relax, let go real fast. If you push it and let go real fast, you feel that bounce. They call that rebound. And when somebody's bleeding out internally, they'll have rebound tenderness. When that rebound happens, it's painful. They might, they'll probably let you do it once. So we have all these things going on. They may feel dizzy. They may feel nauseous. They may be throwing up and vomiting. Uh, their blood pressure is dropping. Their pulse is going up continually, trying to make up for that. And then the faster the pulse goes, we get caught. We get in a catch-22. It beats so fast it doesn't have time to relax and fill. So instead of fill up, beat, fill up, beat, fill up, beat, it's beating so fast there's not enough blood in it, so it's not enough blood coming out. So again, it just furthers the drop in blood pressure. Uh, so that, that, that's another problem within itself there. So when we think about internal injuries, we've got to think about internal bleeding and what is hypovolemic shock so we can recognize it when it happens. Uh, there are some other types of shock also your book will talk about uh, that you do need to pay attention to. But this is what we'll talk about for this part of the lecture. With that, uh, this is a lot of information to digest in one sitting. So if you want, go back and watch this again. Go back and read your text uh, on these portions. Pull off the worksheet that goes with this. Do that worksheet. Report the numbers. You can go back and use the exact numbers I wrote on the board and said in this. They're also on the PowerPoint, the annotated PowerPoint, hopefully you have in front of you. Uh, and be able to go back and, and review it uh, and be ready for that first quiz coming up very shortly.